So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this section where we will discuss euro area productivity in the short and the long run. I don't think to have, I have to spend too many words to explain why this session is important, not just for monetary policy, but I would say for the welfare of the European citizen. Um, however, just to for those of us that have been distracted lately, let me remind just, just two numbers. The first number is 8.6. The second number is 3.5. These two numbers is the rate of growth, the cumulative rate of growth of the, Euro, the US and the Euro area from the last quarter to, of 2019 and the first quarter of this year. Now, this large gap has been driven essentially by the dynamics of productivity. Productivity in the US grew by 6.3% over this period versus 0.7% in the euro area. I think we have to you know, pose some question here. First of all, what, is the, what are the factors behind this gap, which is larger than what we have seen before the pandemic? Second question is, um, is this poor performance of the euro area cyclical or structural? What is even more important, how is going to unfold in the future, especially looking at the challenges that the euro economy will face in the coming years? I'm thinking to climate change, I'm thinking to demography, I'm thinking to the next wa wave of IT innovation, I'm thinking to geographical risks. Today we are well equipped. To, to discuss this important topic because we have with us two very distinguished scholars. We have Professor Antonin Bergeau, who he will set the stage of our discussion by presenting his paper that is titled The Past, the Present, and the Future of the European Productivity. And then we have Professor Kalina Manova, who will discuss Professor Bergeau's paper. Let me briefly introduce the two speakers. Both of them have impressive and very long CV, and uh, we would exhaust our time if I had to go through them as they actually deserve. So in the interest of time, let me limit myself to the essential. So Professor Bergo is a current associate professor of economics at HICEC Paris, while Professor <coughs> Kalina Manova is professor of economics at the University College of London. Before moving to the substance of the, of the matter, let me remind of the rule of the game. So, Antonin, you will have 25 minutes to present your paper, and then, Kalina, you will have 15 minutes to discuss it, to make your consideration. At the end, um, Antonin will have three, three minutes to, to try to reply, and, and this should... Uh, leave us 15 minutes for answer, for, uh, for question from the, from the public. So, Anthony, the floor is yours. Okay, so thanks a lot for the, the great introduction. And I'm very honored and pleased to, to be here today to talk about European productivity. Uh, and European growth in the, long, um, in the long run. So when we think about growth in the very long run, we can keep this number in mind, 2.1%. This is the average GDP per capita growth in the euro area. It's exactly the same number that we will find in the US since 1890. But contrary to the US, where this was extremely stable over time, in the euro area, what you see is that most of these gains were concentrated over a three-decade period during which consumption per capita was multiplied by three, while we managed to reduce working time by 400 hours on average per capita. But since then, growth has been progressively declining, and since 1995, the average GDP per capita in euro area is 1.1%, and since 2004, it's only 0.7%, which has been challenging uh, for public policy and monetary policy. So if we want to introduce productivity into this picture, there is a very simple way to do it, it would be to state that GDP per capita is equal to GDP divided by unit of labor times 
the number of units of labor divided by population. And since 1890, we managed to get 20 times more efficient in producing one unit of value added. And how did we decide to split this? We multiplied GDP per capita by 10, and we divided our working time by two. And so to understand the dynamic of GDP per capita, it's very important to first think about what are the productivity gains we can expect. Then we can think about how these gains could be redistributed between consumption, investment, that would be GDP per capita, or leisure and uh, less working time, that will be uh, the second term. So in this paper, I want, in, um, to, uh, uh, in this presentation, I want to talk in 23 minutes about 200 years of data um, spanning the GDP per capita in Europe over the 20th century, and in particular explain what happened during the 50, 80 uh, exceptional period and why didn't we manage to continue uh, this exceptional period of growth. Then I will focus on the reason behind the slowdown since 1995 and discuss uh, the future of Europe productivity around essentially uh, one question about the impact of artificial intelligence in the near future. Okay, so let me start quickly uh, about this uh, very long 1890-1995 period. So there's another decomposition that we can use that is very convenient to understand the dynamics of GDP per capita. We can split GDP per capita into four different terms, TFP, capital intensity, employment rates, and average working time. And if we implement this decomposition and look at the average growth rate over the, all this period, what we see is that, unsurprisingly, population is what drives most of GDP in the US, much less in your area, by the way, but TFP is what, the, ye the yellow bar is what remains uh, the most important factor explaining the long-term development of GDP uh, per capita in most of the country for which we have data. We can go a little bit further and use this decomposition to look at the difference between the euro area and the US. So what you see in this picture is the relative GDP per capita in the euro area compared to the US. If you sum all the bars in a given year, you would get to this relative gap. And what you can see is that if you, stop, if you start in 1950, right after World War II, there is a huge difference in terms of GDP per capita between the US and Europe, and this is essentially driven by differences in TFP. It's of course because Europe was uh, just exiting World War II with a lot of disruption, but also because the US experienced a very significant productivity wave that started in the 30s and continued uh, up to the 50s. And as a result, what you can see is that this yellow area, which captures the difference in TFP between the two regions, really disappeared over this period of 30 years. So essentially, all of the growth that we see in, those, um, in, the, in these periods is due to um, the euro area resolving its TFP differences with the US. And then after 1975, what happened is that the negative relative contribution of employment rates, so green area, started to, to, to appear, and also a working time declined faster than the US. So the point is that after 1970, we really started to implement our preference for uh, more redistribution and more leisure, but the issue is that at the same time, we started to fall behind the US in terms of TFP, and that means that we cannot have growth in that case, because uh, there is no TFP gains to finance this uh, declining working time. So what made this catch-up possible? Um, there's, of course, a lot of investment coming up, and that's uh, how you can increase GDP through this capital deepening effect, but also Europe increased its total factor productivity quite significantly, relying on two important factors. Europe had a very educated population relatively to other regions. They also massively adopted U.S. technologies, and the share of U.S. firms in, in French and German patents, for example, increased from 10 to 25%, and this is essentially driven by superstar manufacturing firms from the U.S., and so, in a way, it was easier to grow at this time because all you had to do was to adopt technologies that were created in the US, and we know that this creates a lot of spillovers and generate follow-up innovation in uh, the euro area. But Europe also relied on an almost unlimited supply of energy that's coming from oil, and that stopped in 1975. So when you cannot use those leverage to continue to grow, what can you do? You can rely on, on, on innovation policy. And the fact is, during this time, Europe didn't really implement an R&D policy that will allow the euro area to follow up with TFP improving innovation after, all, after 1970. Public investment, if we compare to the US, public investment into R&D were not coordinated enough across country and not enough mission oriented. To give you a brief picture of what the US did, and there is a nice poster in the lobby about that, federal R&D expenditure in the US were almost 2% of GDP in the 60s. 
the NASA alone represented 40 billion US dollars, and that created massive spillovers, including to technologies that were far away from the direct implication of those investments. If you look at Europe, Europe innovation policy during those decades essentially rely on the development of national champions, uh, which somehow worked, but they also couldn't benefit from the large market that the US had. They also, it's, it's also very riskier uh, innovation policy. The failure are very costly when you invest everything in the same uh, candidates. It limited the entry of competitor, and they also face uh, competition from the US and then from Japanese firms. And as a result, Europe as a world couldn't switch from its growing uh, drivers during those three decades to a country or a region that would be able to implement new technology. And Europe as a whole missed the IT revolution. We can see it uh, by looking at the trend of TFP. You see the blue uh, line in the US. You can see this small wave in the 90s that's essentially driven by uh, IT technologies. This is not something that we experience in Europe. And there's many other evidence in the paper that show that European firms didn't implement uh, IT in a way that would generate productivity gains. So let's now move to the past 30 years. So as a result of this Smith IT revolution, and unsurprisingly, labor productivity in the euro area and the US were div diverging from 1995. This divergence stopped after the great financial crisis, and, um, and, and, and the, the relative level was maintained at the a, at a, at a same position. But then after the pandemics, and this is the number that uh, Piero remained, um, there is this relative decline of European labor productivity compared to the US. Actually, if you look at deviation from the trend, it's even more worrying in the, in the euro area. We are really, really uh, falling behind our pre uh, great financial crisis trend. So why is that? So there's many, many different candidate causes. There are short-term causes. And <clears throat> the, probably the, the, the most obvious one is that the shock that we, we, we faced recently, the pandemic, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, they happen in a context where unemployment in the euro area was very low and firms faced historically high hiring difficulties. And as a result, firms reacted to these negative shocks by adjusting their output much more than their labor. And they, they kept the workforce in the firm to some extent. So when the output declined more than labor, labor productivity declined mechanically. There's also geopolitical risk, and we discussed that yesterday, and, and, and disruption of global value chains as a result of international tensions. This had uh, a very strong impact on productivity because they will impact much more firms involved in international trade, and those firms are much more productive than others. There were also some questions about potential zombification of the economy that comes from uh, policy uh, support during COVID, and the worries that this support will have created uh, will allow firms that are not productive enough to survive due to Due to, um, the, the, due to the supports. Uh, I think this is, in the, the past quarter, this has been completely offset by an increase in exits, uh, but this cl clearly created a drag in productivity before. But in fact, on top of those short-term causes that are likely to resolve in the, in the next quarters, there are structural causes that are much more worrying. Um, First, there is, seems to be a structural reduction in working time in Europe. If you look at deviation from the pre-pandemic trend, we are not 10 hours below, on average per person, 10 hours below what we used to work. And it doesn't seem that this is catching up to the pre-pandemic trend, so that could capture change in preferences. But what I really want to discuss more is this idea that R&D expenditure is clearly misallocated in Europe. And that creates what we call a middle technology trap. So let me briefly tell more about this misallocation of R&D. R&D expenditure in the euro area are at 2.3% of GDP. This is much less than in the US. This is basically the level of China, but China is trending up while Europe is not. Um, if you look at public R&D expenditures, in fact, it's exactly at the same level as the US. So it's not necessarily an issue of public spending. It's not an issue that we don't spend enough into R&D. It's mostly an issue about who benefit from this public spending of R&D. And in fact, in Europe, if you look at the biggest uh, innovator, you would find that it's very much focused on what, they call, what we call sometimes middle technology. So let's look at top patenting firms in 2005 in the US and in the euro area. In the US and the euro area, you find very famous manufacturing firms. And in the euro area, Siemens, Bosch, Ericsson, Philips, Bass. Uh, it's mostly chemical and, and, um, and appliance manufacturing. Now let's move to 2023. You can see really clearly that the US made this shift toward digital technology producing goods. And what happened if we look at Europe, we find the exact same firms that we did in 2005, except that Siemens was replaced. Um, so that's an issue, the fact that we couldn't manage somehow to generate an innovation policy that would allow us to make the switch that happened in the US, and that most of the 
R&D spender in Europe are still producing goods that existed 20, 30 years ago. There's many, many more evidence on that. We can look at global patenting. This is international patents, so we can compare regions. You can see that um, Europe is falling a little bit behind as a result of China taking over after 2001. But if you focus on high-tech patents, that would be mostly digital technologies, biotech, and AI, Europe is almost non-existent. It's back to 10% of uh, total patent. And by the way, this includes the UK. Um, so if you just look at your area, this number will be even below. So we are really not so good at producing high technology, and it's not so clear why. And there could be you know, many reasons that are the same, that the reason ex that explain why we missed the IT revolution a few decades before. Um, European innovation policy are, not, are still not sufficiently coordinated. The benefit, the advantage that we have in Europe, uh, the large market, are not exploited enough. We don't, probably don't use capital market. I, I know there are, there are many discussions about using uh, integrated better the capital market across different regions, but at the moment, it's not working sufficiently well. But also the tools that we use, the R&D subsidies, um, the tools that we use to, to, to incentivize firms to innovate, are known to be particularly inefficient. Why is that? It's because it's very hard to direct R&D expenditure, R&D um, tax credit to the right firm. And by right firm, I mean the firm that will be able then to generate productivity enhancing innovation. Those firms, those firms that have the capability to transfer R&D into productivity, they probably have some characteristics that are very hard, if not impossible, to observe. So when you direct R&D subsidies to firms based on their size or based on their age or based on the sector, it's very likely that you will give too much uh, R&D tax credit to firms that are not necessarily uh, the best one uh, that, that, should, that should receive this allocation of R&D. There's another tool for, that we know is, is, is very efficient, and I think we should rely much more on it in Europe, is to bet on the spillovers from the public, public to the private R&D. Um, and in fact, we know from history that this spillover can be quite substantial. We have evidence from the Cold War in the US, there are those massive investments that was um, done by the federal government into the NASA and into a military project. They generated huge uh, innovation um, and gains and huge productivity gains in the private sector even decades after they stopped. And there's also successful examples in Europe when you give subsidies to good laboratories, it generates spillovers to, to the private sectors. And in a way, it's, you know, this trick of, of betting on, on the spillovers from the public to the private sectors is a way to, to play around this idea that R&D subsidies are very hard to target. If you give the money to laboratories, then you will only have firms that are able to exchange with laboratories and to benefit from the spillover that will generate um, productivity and innovation out of it. So I think this is the kind of policy that we should implement much more, and I think this is something that the US is much, uh, much better at doing as we are in Europe. Um, let me just finish this part by saying that one of the additional reasons why I think we should really bet on this, this tool is that in fact, um, while Europe is not so good in terms of patenting, and I showed you uh, some aggregate number, but, you, but, but we can do it technology by technology, Europe is actually very good, or relatively good, at producing the basic knowledge that is usually done in university that goes into uh, feeding those patents. So this is to give you the share of paper, academic paper, that have that been produced country by country and that I use in patents that are then you know, protecting those inventions in, in those six chosen technologies that are representative of you know, new, new high technologies. So while Europe almost has zero patent in those technologies, they still produce 25 to 30% of the basic knowledge that is used in those technologies. So it's not an issue of, again, R&D expenditure globally we spend enough, at least from the public uh, side. It's not an issue of, of the quality of our researchers. It's really an issue about scaling up and getting into commercializable applications. Okay, let me talk now in the remaining time about the future, and I essentially want to talk to you about AI. Um, what can we expect from artificial intelligence in terms of growth? So AI can impact growth through many, many channels, and, and this is why we, we, we think of AI as a general purpose technology, very much like the one we, we had in the past. Um, AI can impact growth through the automation channel, so AI can automate some tasks that are not so core uh, for my work, and so they can free up time for me to, to work on more uh, creative and valuable activities that would potentially generate some uh, additional productivity. AI can obviously also 
enhance my efficiency by complementing me in the tasks that I'm doing. I can you know, translate things faster. I can write better codes, uh, improve my, my writing in English. Uh, AI, and that's also an automation channel, but AI can also automate the production of ID or generate new services, new good and new uh, development that were impossible to reach before uh, the technology existed. And in fact, if you think that AI can even automate or improve R&D productivity, then the potential gain that you could get from adopting AI could potentially be, be extremely large. And finally, AI will substitute some labor with capital, and that creates a capital deepening effect that we know generates uh, growth. Okay, let me first talk about the automation channel. There is a recent uh, contribution by Darren Asimoglu that offers a very simple way to estimate this automation channel from, derived from, from a, a task-based model. Essentially, what you need to do is to multiply those four uh, numbers. The share of GDP that is accounted for by exposed tasks, exposed to AI, the share of this task for which it is cost effective to use AI, the average saving cost from adopting AI, and then the labor share. So let's try to put some number in each of those. Um, first, what is the share of tasks, the share of occupation that are going to be impacted by AI? To understand this, it's very important to define an occupation, not as a monolithic object, but as a continuum of tasks. Some of these tasks are very much exposed to AI. Some of these tasks are very hard to automate. And as a result, occupations are going to be ranked, this is the y-axis, differently in terms of how much they are exposed to AI. Um, if you look at the accountant, telemarketer, or secretary, those are occupations where AI is very good, and especially generative AI is very good at uh, doing the kind of task that those, um, those occupations are doing. If you take a baker, for example, AI is not going to be uh, too good at producing those tasks. But on top of that, there is an additional dimension, which is the fact that even though AI can technically replace you in some of your tasks, it must be very risky, very inefficient, or very costly to do so. If you think of a physician, for example, um, there's many things that AI can do. Radiologists can be uh, very well complemented by AI, but in fact, that will be very costly in most of the case, and it's very unlikely that you know, physicians are going to disappear completely as a result of AI in the near future. So when we integrate all this, we can rank occupations in this uh, two-dimensional graph, and I will get to a number that I will tell you in a minute. But before that, let's uh, try to find a measure of how much more efficient we are when we use AI in uh, the tasks that are impacted. So again, this is only on task where AI can um, automate what I do, and where it's cost effective to uh, actually implement this technology. There's some evidence from the literature, essentially using generative AI uh, and, and using RCT, that shows that workers that use generative AI in their work tend to be faster. There's, a, for example, a 40% increase in uh, how fast it is for analysts to produce uh, reports. They tend to be more precise in, in, in forecasting competition. Actually, uh, the, the forecasters using AI are much more precise uh, than others, so that could be interesting for some of you, I guess. Um, and, and, and also more creative. If you did this competition where uh, they ranked story written with AI and without AI, and in fact, the, um, the one written with generative AI are, are considered to be, to be more qualitative. Uh, there's still also some negative impact. So there, there's evidence in the literature that workers tend to bully, to trust too much AI, including in task where AI is not so good and actually not much better than human in doing uh, the job. <coughs> Sorry. And that's particularly true for radiologists. Uh, we realized that, uh, in fact, radiologists that use AI tended to, to believe too much uh, what the AI was saying, and as a result, were actually less efficient than radiologists that didn't use AI. Um, so to give you, to go back to, to this decomposition and give you some number, um, I have much more detail in the paper into how I get to this, but just to give you an order of magnitude, you can think that there's 45% share of GDP accounted by exposed tasks, but among those 45% of tasks, only 40% of them will be cost effective to automate. And among those tasks that are both cost effective to automate and exposed by AI, I assume that there is a 35% increase in efficiency, and then we multiply all this by the labor share, and this is how we get to this number, which is how much we can expect in let's say the next 10 years uh, in terms of gains from adopting AI. And again, this is, so, so, the, so we get in the euro area on average three cumulative three percentage point increase in the next three years. 
which, you know, it's not zero, it's not substantial, it's certainly much less than uh, what we expected ex ante and, and what we experience with other technologies, general purpose technologies. But it's important to keep in mind that this is only the automation channel. This is only what you get from adopting existing AI, which we know can be adopted as almost zero cost. So it's very likely that these are gains that uh, we are going to experience uh, in the near future. But in fact, most of the gains from AI, they are not coming from this automation channel. They are coming from our ability to use AI to produce new ideas, produce new services, and um, produce new goods. But to do that, this requires massive investment into this technology. It requires to be at the technological frontiers, and it requires to have firms that uh, have the capability to adapt AI and to completely transform their way of production. And here again, if we look at where Europe is standing in terms of being at the frontier in terms of AI, it's not completely catastrophic, especially if you compare to other high technology, but looking at patents, Euro area is already lagging behind with the US and China um, quite, quite significantly. And although there are some startups and some models that are developed in Europe and are very promising, and um, although we also have uh, evidence that European firms adopt AI at the same rate as American firms, the fact that we are still second mover into producing those technologies, globally speaking, is, is a bit worrying. But here again, there is this paradox <clears throat> that if we look at the academic paper on AI, weighted by citations, the paper that are, very, that are used by engineers to create those models and those AI tools, if you pile up every European country, you get to 11 million citation weighted paper. This is almost the same as the US. So again, it's not that we don't have the knowledge to create this model, we actually do have the knowledge. What we fail to do is to convert this into um, patenting and into uh, firms that would be uh, at the frontier in producing AI. Now in, a few, in, the, in the last minute I have, I want to quickly talk about green transition, so I won't have um, time to, to get into much detail. What I just wanted to see here is that, um, you know, if we think that green innovation is an important building block in the green transition, and I certainly believe it is, there is a silver lining for Europe, is that Europe is a clear leader in producing green technologies. If you look at patenting in green technology, Europe is, is actually uh, above uh, the UK, the, the US and, and uh, China. Um, we also find, and there's uh, results in the paper, that green innovation actually generates significant spillovers, including in other technologies. So investing into those green innovation will generate productivity gains, you know, not only in, in, for firms that are actually implementing those innovations. So that's really a good news for Europe, uh, and I think, you know, in, and I think this is what we are doing. We should really structure our innovation policy around those mission-oriented projects, again, betting more on uh, our strength, which is um, our academic sector. Um, there is still one uh, point of um, offering uh, in Europe is that most of the trend in green innovation is driven by young firms. In fact, if you look at the share of patents that are green or labeled as green worldwide, but that would be true in Europe as well, you can see that the increase started in the end of the 90s that after the Kyoto Protocol, but it stopped after the great financial crisis. And in a recent paper with Philippe Agu and Kota, we show that, um, in fact, this stopped is entirely explained by the tightening of credits that disproportionately impacted young firms. So there is a point of vigilance here that although we are, you know, in Europe producing uh, green innovation at a very efficient rate, uh, this was driven by, by young firms, and, and it's very important to ensure that those firms can find uh, the, the, the way to finance their risky uh, and new projects into green innovation. So to conclude, in this paper, uh, again, I tried to cover the 150 years of data. Um, if I would have to summarize very quickly, the past is really much, the post-World War II essentially, is very much explained by catching up due to the adoption of US technology, low energy price, and investment following World War II. But innovation policy implies that we also missed uh, IT revolution. And I think the lesson for the present is that while we, are ten we tend to repeat the same mistake as we did uh, at the end of the 80s, I think we should capitalize much more on European strength. And that is good research, good academic research, a large market size, and our leads in uh, green innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonin. Kalina, please, the floor is yours. Good job. So. 
Thank you for the opportunity to be part of Sintra this year. Um, Antonin has just given us a wide sweeping overview of a vast literature, um, and it's very impressive, the economic and geopolitical context that he provides for the past, present, and future of European productivity. The economics came forward in the presentation, but I do encourage you to see more on geopolitics in the paper. So there's a lot of insightful uh, analysis contained in this brief presentation. For me, as a perennial intrepid optimist, perhaps the most valuable are the policy prescriptions for innovation and some of the optimistic take on technological prospects for the future of Europe. What I would like to do is to actually give a global perspective and a globalization perspective on European productivity. And I'd like to leave you with three messages. First, globalization creates opportunities for growth, but seizing those opportunities requires some prerequisites, firm efficiency, efficient markets, and stable institutions. This is going to echo some of the messages that came from Antonin's presentation. Second, I think we need to be firmly focused on firms. We do care about macroeconomic policy, we care about aggregate outcomes, but at the end of the day, firms are the decision makers, they are the economic agents responding to those policies, so we do need to remember that they're firms and heterogeneous firms are acting in a global context. And third, I think it's important to think about policy spillovers. What I mean by that is both the interdependence in the effects across policies, but also the spillover of policies across borders, given that we live in a global world. So in the 20th century, it was very easy to say countries that are more open to trade as gauged by their share of exports to GDP on the vertical axis are the ones that are growing faster. In the 21st century, it's all about chips and ships. There's been technological change and trade policy movements that have really transformed the landscape of international trade. We've seen this rise of global value chains and multinational activity, deeper financial labor market integration, and all of this in the face of large asymmetries across countries in terms of market structures and institutions. So I think the two words that really um, capture the key features of globalization today are interconnectedness and interdependence, with all the positive and perhaps some negative associations that brings. It has triggered intensified policy debates, and yes, global cooperation is under fire today. So as bold and perhaps as off topic as it might seem to talk about globalization, I think it's actually doubly important to remember why globalization shapes productivity and innovation. So here is a map of the world that the World Bank produced in 2020. This is reflective of data for 2015, uh, which sort of signals that based on their GVC participation and innovation patterns, most of the developing world is still active in limited commodities in orange, high commodities in pink, some manufacturing in light blue, advanced manufacturing and services, China, in darker blue, and North America and Europe being dominant in innovation. But actually, if we think about who the global leaders today are, well, the landscape is changing fast. In the 20th century, we're used to saying, look, it's the West and Western headquarters multinationals innovating in the West, um, pushing the world frontier and deploying those technologies globally. Well, today, we see a lot of pioneers leapfrogging and innovating at the frontier in emerging economies. And here is an example at the peak of the COVID pandemic in late 2020, Chinese company AutoX introduced the first driverless cars in the streets of San Francisco, beating the American Waymo to the punch. So let me give you an overview of why globalization forces matter for the path of productivity. The fragmentation of production across firm boundaries and country borders can put firms on a steeper growth path. And there's a distinction here to be made between improving performance given firms' own productivity and production processes and actually enabling firms to improve their own productivity through technological upgrading. We know these forces. Access to imported inputs can allow you to lower your production costs and improve your output quality. If you have access to a bigger export market, um, you can benefit from economies of scale in, a, in um, production. If we think about upgrading your productivity, while well, access to export markets is actually going to encourage you to incur the whatever fixed and sunk costs associated with innovation and adoption there are. Import competition might force you to reassess, are you more profitable with innovation or without if you want to remain competitive? 
There is also active knowledge transfer when you interact with foreign buyers and suppliers, as well as passive spillovers. And here, on the supply side, you're learning about production know-how, you're upping your management practices. On the sales side, you're developing market expertise in distribution and product customization, and you're stepping on the shoulders of giants. You're enabling follow-on innovation. Participating in global value chains also inherently means that you're changing the set of tasks you're retaining in-house. And this reorganization means that there is scope for efficiency gains that will inherently bring with it a reorganization of your occupational and skill composition, perhaps the way you run your management, perhaps the extent to which you can engage in innovation. So what are the challenges to seizing those opportunities? Well, you gotta have knowledge of how to participate in the value chain and be at the technology frontier. You have to have the capability to implement any change in-house, and you have to have the right incentives in terms of cost and benefits. So I would link that to firm prerequisites. We need firms that have technological know-how, but also the right management competence and management practices in place. Um, and we need to have stable institutions we need to have efficient capital, labor, and product markets. We need to have enabling logistics services that are going to lubricate these global production networks. What I'll do next is sort of embrace pointillism and give you um, an overview of a few projects that I've been involved in that illustrate some of these forces. And I'm going to signal those with a little light bulb that you know links to a specific paper. Um, and the little European flag tells you the application had something to do with the European data set. So yes, we know that production fragmentation improves from performance given your own technology. In the context of China, for example, you see firms that are importing more inputs are able to improve their output quality. In the context of domestic fragmentation for Belgium, for example, we see that larger firms are able to transact with more input suppliers and downstream buyers. Um, this allows them to keep their input costs low and increase their profits. What is required for this to happen? Management practices matter. We're used to talking about productivity as a TSP residual, a black box residual from an estimation function. There is a bottom-up approach that says management competence is actually something tangible. There are practices you can implement in the firm that are really going to help. We were able to establish this using Chinese and US data, and you see in both very different countries that better managed firms are able to use higher quality inputs and more complex assembly processes to produce higher quality goods at the same time as being more efficient in producing these high quality goods and having superior expert performance. On the left hand side here, you see the systematic variance, variation in average management practices across countries, North America in blue and Europe in orange do come up tops. On the right hand side, you see evidence from India that management interventions work and even eight years after implementing a management consulting intervention, the number of adopted practices remains quite high for both the treated plants and non treated plants in the treatment firms. So management practices matter. Institutions matter. So when we just take two countries with good and worse institutions, we might say, look, welfare is going to be higher if you have stronger institutions. When we are talking about implementing reforms, in this case, I'm looking at globalization, increasing export access, or increasing import competition pressures, the marginal effects of those kind of interventions um, can be positive or negative on the overall gains from trade because we live in the world of the second best. Empirically, what we saw looking at data for Europe spanning about 20 years to ending in 2015 was uh, something quite subtle. Efficient institutions, labor, capital, and product markets actually amplify the productivity gains from import competition, but on the margin, they dampen the extra gains from export expansion. Trade finance matter. There's a lot of evidence documented that, that access to well-functioning financial systems is tremendously important for firms' ability to export entry, expansion into more markets. Um, these effects were particularly strong during episodes of financial crisis. Trade is much more sensitive to drying up of credit than overall production is. It also bounces back faster. And the effects are concentrated on smaller firms and financially more sensitive sectors. What I've currently been thinking about is not just trade finance, but also trade finance insurance. Given the rise of economic, climate, geopolitical risk across the globe, how do we think about that? Well, Bern Union is the organization of private and public um, trade finance insurers. And looking at that pattern, what you see here in the right figure is a systematic 
uh, relationship between the share of private insurance in total trade insurance and country risk. So expert credit agencies have the mandate to step in when the private sector doesn't cover risky transactions. In practice, we see that that can be quite a valuable instrument. Market competition matters. It's not only the institutions, but also how we think about efficient capital labor product markets. So given that we're an interconnected global world, market structures in one country, and of course anything to do with industrial policy and interventions that change that market structure will have repercussion effects through um, upstream and downstream sectors locally, but also internationally. So in this particular project, we looked at how the dramatic liberalization in China at the turn of the 21st century increased market entry upstream in China. And this dramatically improved sourcing outcomes for downstream buyers in France and Chile as this application was, leading to no lower input prices, much better firm profits, and considerably higher consumer welfare. So behind the border policies can have international spillovers as well. So this is how globalization can change from performance given their own productivity, but it can also enable channels of actually changing your own productivity and production practices. So the first thing to note is that when you're reorganizing tasks across firms, it does mean a technological change within each of those firms. And this is currently of interest in the literature. There's evidence this matters both when you think about domestic fragmentation of production as well as global outsourcing. So for example, for the case of China, we see that within firms over time, there's a very well pronounced firm life cycle. As firms grow bigger, more productive, and more experienced, they are able to span wider segments of the global value chain, and this correlates with higher profits. Not necessarily a higher profit margin, but higher profits overall. Focusing on domestic fragmentation, we're able to study these questions in Brazil. And what you see is that firms that outsource more tasks to domestic suppliers retain in-house relatively more complex tasks that hire more skilled workers. There's an upgrade in the occupation scale and a shift towards uh, managerial uh, involvement. How about innovation? Not just redrawing firm boundaries and changing task composition, but genuinely engaging in R&D activity that pushes the frontier. Well, yes, historically, and to this day, multinationals are the ones advancing the world frontier. They conduct the vast majority of world R&D, and they are responsible for media mediating technology across borders. However, multinationals increasingly offshore their R&D operations abroad. They're not just doing this in Western headquarter countries. Here is an example of two leading German car automakers. Mercedes-Benz opened an R&D lab in Seattle, and soon thereafter, BMW opened one in Shanghai. And both of these are engaging cutting edge stuff. The Seattle one is doing cloud computing. The Shanghai one is doing um, automotive design and autonomous driving. So in recent work, I'm looking at the innovation activity of German multinational and taking sort of a holistic perspective of how they organize their production and innovation activities across the globe. So what you see is that of patenting multinationals, almost half, 43%, in uh, file patents that were invented abroad. The top five hubs are the US, Austria, France, Switzerland, and the UK, but China and India are in the top 15, and this figure, you know, each dot is, you know, where there's been innovation by German multinationals, it clearly spans the gamut of GDP per capita across countries. By looking at global patent outcomes, we can also think about the revealed comparative advantage of different countries in different sectors, something that came up in Antonin's presentation as well. We see that Germany is a continued leader in organic chemistry, so pharmaceuticals, energy, transportation. The US is very strong in medical technology, IT, and telecommunication. Switzerland is very strong in precision instruments, medical technology. Multinationals are offshoring both basic and applied innovation. Think of applied as something that improves your production efficiency today and forever. Basic is something that you have no use for it today, but maybe tomorrow it will allow you to be successful in applied innovation. Basic innovation tends to be offshore to rich countries. Applied innovation seems to have cost energy sweep production tends to be offshore to more emerging economies. Finally, innovation happens around the globe. We have seen a dramatic increase in the number of patents filed with the US and the European Patent Office that were invented abroad, in this case, China. This is what you see in the left figure here. What I'd like to highlight is that this could be not just because um, domestic 
R&D institutions are not sufficient, but also because these firms are using the granting of a US patent to expand their sales in global markets. So this tends to signal quality capacity and contract credibility. So in my last minute, let me leave you with some open questions that will anticipate our discussion. We do need to weigh growth objectives against what I would call growth plus, plus, plus objectives. How we think about inequality, how we think about resilience in terms of stable output and growth, how we think about sustainability in terms of stable institutions, social cohesion, and climate health. And finally, I think we should reassess how we think holistically about joint trade, investment, and innovation policies in light of the rapid technological change that we are experiencing. Thank you. Thank you, Kalina. Thank you, Kalina. So, Anthony, how do you integrate these more cross-cutting cross views that Kalina was giving us with your more sectoral focused approach? I think it's uh, super interesting and definitely um, very relevant. I, I, I do believe that international trade and, 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 and global value chains is very important in explaining productivity and, and definitely agree with you that institution matters a lot. Um, I think some, something that I found very fascinating with your research is that we, it's a way to kind of open the black box of what happened when we trade, when we exchange IDs and patents, and I think this is something very important to understand CFP. Um, you know, I don't have detailed comment to give, but I definitely think this is, of course, a very complementary approach. Thank you for the discussion. Great, so we already have three questions. One, yes, first over there, one over there, the second one over there, so and I see a bunch of there. So let's get three <coughs> questions first, and then we, we proceed. So we go first. Yeah. So, so if you think about uh, the, you know, why the United States has become dominant in IT technology, one has to think about Silicon Valley. One has to think about Stanford University. And one has to think about Hewlett Packard and, and the role they played. And if you think about those, then, then you know, Stanford was a private university. Hewlett Packard was a private company in a small company and you know there were a few other players that that arrived uh, there and you know some of it was luck perhaps but but i think much of that came from you know private and free market in that area with huge subsidies from the government no doubt right there were research grants given to stanford university and so forth so they played a role but i i wonder whether you know one of the reasons that europe is lagging behind is that we haven't found the magic juice that they had Please, over there, and then. Uh, yes, Luis Garicano, LSC. Um, so uh, a couple of comments. One on the AI, I, I think it's really premature to try to put uh, numbers on how big AI is. Let me, let me just, uh, on productivity, let me just give you one example of yesterday's New York Times, the Ukrainians automating uh, robots to fight the war for themselves. I mean, that's gonna be a big deal uh, in, in productivity of soldiers. Um, second, on, on the key issue of EU, uh, US, we are, I think all very worried, and I, I, I personally am a bit panicked about this uh, disappearance of, of, of European firms from the digital frontier. And I think, I, I, I read your evidence, which was very interesting, in a different way. I think it's clear what you argue, I mean, to me, what isn't. So you said public, we should do more public research. Well, public research we seem to be doing, and your data suggest it works out. I mean, the universities actually seem to produce lots of good ideas, and that's where the public research happens in Europe. Um, the second scale, Leta has emphasized it, we all believe in it, uh, European single market is important. True, but you showed that Japan on high-tech patents is just really doing very well compared to us. Um, they don't have the scale. Uh, it seems to me that it, the problem is not really getting the ideas, it's turning the ideas into commercial products, and that's very much about rules and regulations and firm growth. Let me just give you one example from your slides, uh, no, from, 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 um, from Inova's slides, which was cars. So do you see a European city allowing for self-driving cars in the next 15 years? Like, uh, I mean, with all the lobbies of, of taxi drivers, of citizens' concern about getting run over. We see that happening in China. We see that happening in the US. Our political process, our, the way we are regulating all of this is very risk averse. And we are not being able to actually allow all these ideas and all this innovation to get into commercial. So people just have a good idea and they leave. 
So those, 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 are those two comments. Thank you. Thank you. Then we get one more question from that side, and then we move on the other side. Please. Thank you. I'm in the business of prematurely putting numbers on things, and I wondered if I could put you on the spot a little bit in terms of the AI impact. The, I think the Asimoglu paper says about 1% cumulatively on GDP and TFP over, over the next decade. If I look at the numbers that you put down in, in his classification, that gives me something on the order of 4%. But then you say, I think very rightly, that the big, the, the big boost can come from the creation of new tasks, not just doing existing things more efficiently. And I, I, I was just wondering whether you could share a guess with us how much that is worth and what the total might be over the next decade. I know it's super hard to come up with a number, but I would love a number. Thank you. <laughs> Antonin and then Kalina, briefly, so that we can Right. Get some more questions, please. Um, I'm going to be very brief. So I fully agree with the first point on um, Stanford being a private university and private companies leading the IT wave. Um, if you look at whose firm is responsible for the share of IT patents, IBM, Intel, and and uh, Ewell Packard are, are, are some of them. Ewell Packard didn't exist in the 70s, I think. Uh, IBM existed, and they grow also a lot because uh, of R&D procurement from the federal government. Um, so I, even though those are private firms and private university, the government was very helpful into ensuring that they could take the risk into betting in new um, technologies, and this is what happened, I think. Um, regarding Luis' comments, uh, I completely agree on AI being premature. This is, I think, you know, the, the guess we can have right now, and of course we have no idea what AI is going to be in the few, in the coming years, and, and it's possible that every task is going to be replaced by AI and then you get to infinite, almost infinite growth. So uh, we know. Um, in terms of public research and Japan doing well, in fact, something I haven't shown in the presentation is that if you look at the six technologies that I showed be, uh, at the end and you look at Japan share, the, the share of Japan is actually completely disappearing. Uh, Japan has been completely replaced by China is producing those technologies uh, for um, you know, probably many, many reasons that has to do with global value chain and, and being an innovation hub in, the, in this region. Um, so, so, you know, I think there is more than just, um, I mean, scale effect probably do matter for those new technologies. Um, and regarding rules and regulation, again, I again, completely agree with you. Um, I think also our risk aversion in Europe is not something that is completely exogenous. It's something that we collectively decide to to create, and it's not so clear that we should immediately decide to do exactly what China is doing. It's, um, at some point, we need to understand why we decide to have a competition uh, regulation that is so strict about uh, m and 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 you know all those um, in, uh, all those regulations that are uh, pushing us to be more uh, careful about implementing new technologies. And then a number on AI impact. Uh, maybe I should ask AI to give me a number. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think now uh, to to. I actually had a, um, I mean, if you, if you talk at firms, what, what they really expect from AI is not to replace, I think most people have understood that AI is not going to replace all workers. What they really expect for AI is to be able to reduce uh, the number of mistakes that they make, uh, improve uh, their efficiency by just pre-selecting, um, you know, a lot of the input that they are using into producing their services. And if you think that AI could be very efficient in doing so, that requires some investment, by the way. Um, I, I believe that the number could be substantial. So there are some papers that even you know, mention that uh, uh, growth could be infinite with AI because if AI can generate ID and AI can generate new innovation, then the next, IT, the next technological wave could be discovered by the AI. In that case, the growth um, rate could be very large. So I'm sorry, I don't have a good number to give you. Kalina, something on rules, I guess. Huh? Thank you. Um, if, if we want evidence-based policy, we should not govern by anecdotes, but let me give you two anecdotes that I think are quite representative. One of them is Stanford, where I had the privilege of spending about eight years. Uh, Silicon Valley is special. It is a cluster. It's not just the universities. It's a very highly educated labor force, uh, rich in immigrants. And there's a lot of evidence that immigrants matter tremendously for the US R&D output. And of course, venture capital is just around the corner. In fact, what I still teach to my undergrads is 
um, these remain amazing outcomes of Stanford GSV, where they have a course bridging together, <coughs> it's called Entrepreneurship for Global Challenges, okay? And it puts together uh, the, the entrepreneurs from the business school with some of the tech experts from the science departments. They together come up with projects, there's an internal competition, the top five winning bids are then presented to the local venture capitalists, the top to get funded, and you have lots of success stories every year. So you need a little ecosystem as a cluster. My second anecdote comes from China. Whenever you go there on a conference, um, they're gonna take you on a factory visit. Back in 2010, it was the tomatoes of the future where we walked into what was a airplane-sized hangar with layers and layers of uh, water tanks, rich in nutrients, and tomatoes growing everywhere you can see, and Boston lettuce growing everywhere you can see. Fast forward, last time I was in China before the pandemic was 2019, uh, we were taken, this was in Shenzhen, one of these AI cars. At the time I was told there were five of them. The government was actively supporting them. This was part of the 10,000 talents program. So there were active packages attracting US and UK, well sorry, US educated talent, I think also Europe educated talent. And they had a labor force of about 100 on site, all of them with US education, Silicon Valley experience. Um, and they were still keeping an office in Silicon Valley with two purposes, the CEO was very upfront about this, more talent poaching and cutting edge. So uh, clearly it's a cluster and you know, uh, going back to what I concluded with, I think we need to think holistically about policy design. And my second point on, on AI, I'm by no means an expert, but given that there are some um, opportunities for growth from globalization, can we harness AI towards that? How can we use AI to solve some of our climate models? And given that there's some challenges to seizing those opportunities, how can we harness AI to relax some of the constraints we are facing? So for example, I've been working on biosupplier matching in production networks subject to a lot of contracting frictions and information asymmetry. Can AI, AI sorry, be used to optimize some of these processes? So thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, we don't have much time. Actually, we are already over time, so I'm <laughs> um, closing this section, so the only things I can say, I want to thank our two excellent speakers for this brilliant presentation. Thank you.